probes completely solve for the L factor in the Drake equation. The problem with the, that the Drake equation set up with its factor L, as some, some listeners may know, may be that Drake postulated that two civilizations can only communicate if they exist at the same time in galactic history, that time as adjusted by this, the speed of light for information to go from one to the other. So if our civilization exists for only 10,000 years or 100,000 years, and the other civilization only exists for 100,000 years, that those two 100,000 years have to overlap within the 13.7 billion year lifespan or history of the, of the universe. Chances are not great that they will. But once a probe is launched, it's launched. It's gone. And the fate of the progenitor civilization is no longer a factor. It need no longer persist. That's an interesting point that if you send out a radio signal, you are sending out a roadmap to your home world. But if you send out a probe, there's not really any way to know where that came from if you found it. <laughs> you can't really say, I mean, there, it preserves no information of its origins. So it's it's an interesting Unless it wants to. Unless it wants uh, to. You know, it, yeah, exactly. It's, it depends on how it's being programmed. Now, such a probe has a certain power that I particularly find fascinating. So we find von Neumann probe, right, that's been watching this planet perhaps repeatedly, you know, different probes over many years, building a corpus of knowledge of the natural history of Earth. That would be a heck of a gift to give a civilization on contact and say, here, here's a record of the entire natural history of your planet. Here's a picture of a dinosaur. <laughs> something like that, where they, they could actually also offer something of value to the civilization that they're contacting when they do make contact with that probe, right? Well, that's, actually, that's a fantastic point, uh, and I, I agree with you on that, but presumably they have much more that they can offer on contact as well. That's entirely up to, up to them, but they presumably have a copy of Encyclopedia Galactica on, inscribed on their version of a hard drive. So they probably have brought all kinds of knowledge and information with them, but to feed back information about our own planet is honestly something I've never considered before, John, and I think it's a fantastic point. I think it'd be a nice way to do a first contact is, you know, here you go. And then also here's physics, <laughs> not just part of physics or an yeah. incomplete understanding, but here's physics, <laughs> the entirety of it, you know, so you could, you could do all sorts of things. Do you see now projecting uh, what, what an alien civilization might do? Let's project it to us. Do you see it us someday setting up this sort of a node type communication as we explore different star systems? Ah, uh, better yet. Look, look, when you're using the word node, I'm assuming and, ag and agreeing and also postulate that the probe is connected to other probes. So the probe hypothesis has one deep problem embedded within it, that it is only a one-way system, at least simplistically. When, when the civilization sends a probe, it enters Earth's in, into the Earth's uh, solar system, into our solar system somewhere. Maybe it's sitting on an asteroid. Maybe it's in orbit around the sun. We don't know. But if and when it deigns to communicate with us and deigns to download to us the, the Encyclopedia Galactica, whatever it's brought along with it for our benefit or understanding, how is it going to get information about us back to its progenitor civ civilization or and the way that I would postulate doing that is through a system of transmitter towers, if you will, or transmitting nodes. So essentially, information is, is entirely carooming or, or, or bouncing around the, the, the galaxy, and that information in the whole system actually is only growing as more civilizations contribute information to it. It's, re it's stored and saved redundantly in the system because there may be, the, may be nodes around every star that, that each and every one of them is able to control, is to absorb information and retransmit it onwards, ju just like ce a cell phone tower. Bad actors, you say, where there may be something lurking out there that isn't, <laughs> isn't very nice and other civilizations might not really want to get its attention, so to speak, with a radio beacon. And maybe that's the reason, maybe that's the solution to the firm paradox is that there's just nobody's, nobody's really speaking very loudly and that they just quietly murmur with these 
essentially a, a cell phone network with these nodes where it's a much more efficient way, but it's also much quieter. And you guarantee that even if you don't know if there's a bad actor, it's better to be stealthy and quiet just in case there is, right? Right. And so what exactly do we know of E.T.'s intentions and capabilities? The answer is absolutely nothing. Whether E.T. is similar to Spielberg's smiling uh, characters from Close Encounters or, or uh, E.T., or more similar to Ridley Scott's Aliens or something else altogether, we literally have no idea. And what about their capabilities? Uh, we could, it, it could be said, well, uh, what harm could they do us? I mean, astronomical distances are, after all, astronomical. And I would return to that, that our thought that ET cannot harm us from, from great distances, inter, interstellar distances, may be utterly naive is similar to the Hittites or something, uh, not being able to understand warfare at a distance further than wherever their arrows could shoot. 